touch it here and a fastball Lee goes with it. Now Dernier is going to try and run it down. He can't get to it. And Woods really didn't have that much of a play and tried to come up with something listed underneath the sensational uh, word in the dictionary maybe. But there you see Dernier backing up and he gets to the ball and Mazzilli's in with a two base hit. So that sets the table for Marvell Wynn. If a pirate can set the table for $300 here for Sister M. Annette Casper of East McKeesport in a Giant Eagle home run sweepstakes inning. Now I have Cecilio Grante up in the pirate bullpen. Everybody's taking a turn out there today. Now that's the first hit for the Bucks since the uh, fourth inning. So Sutcliffe has kind of slammed the door. Now they're trying to jar it open again. He had retired seven men in a row since Marvell Wynn reached on an error in the fifth inning. We're now in the eighth. Sutcliffe and the Cubs are leading the Pirates two to nothing here in Wrigley Field, opening day, 1985. Mazzilli at second. A chopper back to Sutcliffe. Looked Mazzilli back to second. I thought he might go there for a minute. He gets the out at first. So did I. That got kind of hairy there for a second or two. Mazzilli becomes a very important run here. If the Bucks could get him home, get that one more shot in the ninth inning, everybody that comes up uh, represents the tying run. So you, you try to get something to happen with that leadoff double. Try to get that run in some way and put yourself only down a run. It really does change the complexion of the game, and it makes the the, the strategy moves in the ninth inning a little bit more uh, evident between Jim Fry and Pirate manager Chuck Tanner. Let's see if Johnny Ray can knock this run in. Paid attendance, 34,551. Total in the house, 35,293. So a big opening day crowd here. Johnny Ray in the game is 0 for 3. Mazzilli at second, one out. Jay Ray fouls it right underneath our broadcast position in Wrigley Field. Well, that'd be a little bit of a surprise for the newer fans that came out today, and they have a foul ball hit back to them. They think, boy, this is going to be an easy play. And are they wrong? <laughs> well, a day like today. Called strike to Jay Ray. It's one and two. Now, I mentioned when Lanny was here about the control of Rick Sutcliffe. Uh, he may run the string out a little bit on you, but he throws strikes most well, of the time. Well, that's the key, as I said, after the second second inning. He establishes the fact that he's going to get the ball where he wants to most of the time. And it's it's not like a lot of pitchers that'll find out which pitch is working for him that day. One of the three, whether it's the fastball curve or slider. But in Sutcliffe's case, he wants to establish that strike zone, get the ball over the plate. Then he'll get into a spot in the game where he'll say, all right, now let me try this or try that. Those guys think ahead sometimes, and it's... Uh, your good pitchers can do that. Roden does the same thing. Except I think Rick will do it maybe with two pitches. Sutcliffe tries to do it with a fastball. Davis sets up outside. Pitch was right there. See, and that, there's the case right there. You tell an umpire and the hitters early in the game just by going through that, hey, I can throw that ball out there when I have to, when I need to. Here's the situation where he needs to. He wants to get that, that hitter out. He has to save the run at second base. Again, Johnny fouls it back. Maybe Giving the key to this inning, though, was uh, Marvell because his job is to try to get that runner down to third, and he wasn't able to do it. Well, you got Sutcliffe six-seven on the mound. Uh, Marvell tries to pull a pitch that he can hit to the right side. Didn't get it over Sutcliffe's head. Maybe a smaller pitcher, <laughs> he might have been able to do it. But uh, you know, you, you'd obviously the the uh, the way to do it is trying to move that runner over with nobody out. Cubs, by the way, have. Smith and Fontenot now throwing in the bullpen, the righty-lefty combination. Of course, Chicago basically doing it last year without a left-hander out of the bullpen in the short situation. Yeah, they didn't have one. Madlock and Thompson waiting for a shot here. In the eighth, two nothing, Chicago. Tried to sneak one past him on the inside part of the plate. Came a little bit too far inside. It's two and two now. Two balls, two strikes, one out. Mazzilli opened the inning with a pinch hit double. You can see Madlock and Thompson in the background. We've talked all spring, Rook, about the bats. 
you can start having them pay off, right? That's true, and you get that feeling that they will. Again, though, with a guy like Sutcliffe, he's pitching his kind of game. I don't think he wanted to go three and two on Ray, though. Jay Ray's battling him. I think it's interesting. You notice the kind of pitches that a, a given pitcher will throw on different counts. One ball and two strikes or two and one. It's it's not so much what he throws but where he throws it. You see Sutcliffe on the two two threw Johnny Ray the fastball but he kept it down low if he was going to hit the ball 90 percent of chance that he was going to hit it on the ground. Another payoff pitch. Now the Pirates have runners at first and second. And as Bill Madlock heads to the plate we'll pause five seconds for station identification. It's opening day on the Pittsburgh Pirate Television Network. KDK TV 2 Pittsburgh. The second walk allowed this afternoon by Sutcliffe. And credit that one to Johnny Ray. The rookie stayed with him. He did. He battled him. He fouled off some good pitches and uh, Johnny has a good eye. He's a tough man to strike out. If there's any plus to what happened is the fact that they have set up the double play but you have a four time batting champion to deal with right now and it builds about due to get things going and these are the kind of games that uh, managers really have a, you know their stomach starts to roll over right here. Madlock hits it hard to center field. Glasses down by Bob Dernier two outs. Well that's about all you can do as a hitter is hit it hard Bill hit it right on the button. So one more chance here in the inning for Sister Aminette Casper of East McKeesport, a Giant Eagle sweepstakes inning with $300 on the line. Pick up those entry forms or send in your postcards because we're going to be playing Giant Eagle home run sweepstakes all season long. Thompson this afternoon is 0 for 2, or rather 1 for 2. He doubled. And then when the ball bounced away from catcher Jody Davis, he attempted to make it to third and was thrown out. That was a big play in the game. Tony Pena ended up with a base hit later on but there is a there's a rule in baseball don't make the first or last out at third base in an inning and Jason happened to be the first out. This is low and away. One ball no strikes. You know you recall that game we did in Lakeland uh, Joe Orsillac did something similar to that and, and Chuck brought it uh, to the attention of our fans at home about making that first or last out in an inning. At the knees it's one and one. Thompson trying to pick up Mazzilli who's at second. Up the middle base hit here comes Lee turning third heading for home. The Pirates are on the board in 1985. It's two to one. That's the way, Jason. Boy, when he hits the ball up the middle other way, doesn't try to pull the ball. This is by his own admission. He's a much better hitter. Watch the swing that he takes. Almost one-handed. That was a heck of a pitch by Sutcliffe, and he's been able to keep the ball down. Now, that's an important play that uh, Mazzilli scores, but there, I think, is more important is Johnny Ray hustling around to third. Yeah, he's in position to score on a pass ball. Wild pitch. Error. And Jim Fry will take a stroll to the top of the dugout and out to the mound as he looks to the bullpen to see if everybody's ready. What do you think? Is he going to go get Sutcliffe here? No, it wouldn't surprise me if he did. Uh, Sutcliffe, you know, opening day, you want that starting pitcher to go as many as you can. He's gone into the eighth inning and he's he's in a uh, a trying situation. It hasn't been, uh, you know, exactly a tough day for Sutcliffe, but there's a lot of wear and tear in the mental the mental fatigue that comes into play right here because of the low scoring game. If you have a few runs to work with you can kind of take things that they come but when you have to concentrate concentrate on every pitch and you get into that grind and late inning late inning in, in the, of the game that the mental fatigue does start to set in and uh, you can make mistakes when things like that happen. So there goes Fry and he goes to the big man pats him on the back. It's a fine job by Sutcliffe and uh, he goes out of the game with the lead. It'll be a two for one switch. Chris Fire also coming off the bench to take over at third for Ron Say. So if you want to flip your card over, you would probably put Spire in the number nine spot in the order and put the new pitcher in Ron Say's spot in the batting order. So we can close the book on Rick Sutcliffe, although the two runners out there are still his responsibility this afternoon. He has given up one run thus far, and the Pirates are trying to tie it up. 
Sutcliffe striking out three, walking two in eight and two thirds inning. There is Spire. Now a Cub. I think he's going to play a very important role in this ball club because of his versatility on the infield. I think it's kind of interesting the makeup of the Cubs. You have you have Chris Spire, Richie Hebner, and and uh, Larry Boa all on the infield as as extra men. Uh, of course, Boa lost his job. Veterans that uh, you know normally you'll have maybe a couple of younger players on the bench that'll come off and the and you're working their way into a into a starting role. But with Dunstan bidding Larry Boa out, the role is kind of reversed. And when you have a guy like uh, Spire to come in here, you have Hebner. Ever all of our fans remember Richie and. And of course Larry Boa a lot of experience coming off the bench and I think over the long haul it pays off. So Lee Smith will be the new pitcher. Lee. 28 years old good size 6'6 225. Now he's a flamethrower and I mentioned earlier that he wasn't he wasn't throwing as hard this spring as the Cubs wanted Smith to and. That's I think the one thing that he has going for him. It's the fact that he can intimidate hitters with his size. I wouldn't want to get uh, in the batter's box and face this guy. Of course I was a pitcher but uh, there are a lot of hitters that they feel uncomfortable when you have that big guy out there and he's throwing the ball all over the place and once he starts throwing strikes gets out in front of the hitters that you don't have any chance against this guy but uh, you know he needs to pitch well for Chicago to come back and try to not only contend but win. Well in 43 save opportunities a year ago. He was successful 33 times a good ratio. He was second. That's the most saves he's ever had in his career. He was second in the National League in saves. So he is the man that they call on to be the stopper. And George Hendrick now will bat for sister M. Annette Casper of East McKeesport. The Pirates have scored a run here in the eighth inning and they still have a couple men on base. Raphael Belliard comes off the bench to run. For Jason Thompson. So we're going to see quite a bit of both rosters the way we're going Rook. That's for sure. Don Robinson still in the pirate bullpen. We assume he'll be the new pitcher as we go to the bottom of the eighth inning. Belliard aboard at first. Smith pitching to Hendrick with runners at the corners for the Pirates two to one the Bucks have scored a run Hendrick takes a strike. You saw that shadow coming across earlier and when you have a guy like Smith out there throwing as hard as he can if he does have that false fastball back uh, you get an idea of how tough it is to pick up the ball he doesn't throw very many breaking pitches he comes with the express. Strike two. No balls, two strikes on George Hendrick. Johnny Ray at third, Raphael Belliard at first, a run in on Jason Thompson's base hit. Thompson, two for three this afternoon with an RBI for the Bucks. Threw it past the catcher. That was a good play by Davis. You saw that he was set up inside, and the ball way off the plate. Watch how quick uh, Jody Davis has to get to this ball, and that's headed right for the dirt. A year and a half ago, Davis was having trouble with those pitches. One ball, two strikes, two on, two outs. Pirates trying to tie it up. Slap down the right field line, but it's slicing foul. That was your old protect the strike zone swing. Sometimes George, like a lot of great hitters, is tougher when there are two strikes on him. You get him up there earlier in the count, he might take a bigger swing, but with the two strikes, he'll cut down a little bit, just lay the bat on the ball and dump it in somewhere. Looked like that's what he was trying to do on the last pitch. George Hendrick. Against Lee Smith. I like George. He's cool. Ray and Belliard, the runners. Did not go for the slider. It's two and two.
Hendrick in the game is 0 for 3.